Good evening. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. Well, let's stand. We're going to sing a little bit tonight. Number 630. Oh, I guess you don't have hymn books, do you? It's just like His great love. Let's sing it tonight. A friend I have called Jesus. We're going to sing about His love for us tonight. prayer tonight. We appreciate your prayers while we were gone. Continue to pray for Ida's dad. Uh, we left and the very next day and he ended up in the hospital. He's still struggling with getting the dialysis just right and all the rest. We'll continue to pray for him. Also remember the family. You might remember several years ago we had a family come for about a year. A couple, Roy and Doreen McMahon. They always sat right over here right where Georgia is and just a little short couple went to Israel with us and Roy passed away on Saturday last and so I have the funeral tomorrow in Hamilton and so would you be in prayer for that and I appreciate your prayers. Pastor Paul and I will be going down uh, to that funeral. Let's go Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on our time together. Brother Tanner, would you leave some prayer tonight please?
Amen. Seated, let's sing some more about the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus loves me, this I know. We'll sing all three verses. another announcement as well and I I didn't forget to mention this but I forgot the weight and I knew everybody all the ladies are going to ask me so Neil and Hilda had a little baby girl on uh, Monday night and uh, we praise the Lord for Carolyn Carolyn Elizabeth and so you'd be in prayer for mom and the baby there were some complications and but now the baby's healthy and we praise the Lord for that seven pounds four ounces that's the part I forgot and I thought I got to remember that or else I'll have to answer every lady afterwards. Well, how much did the baby weigh? And I said to Neil, how, how long? They want to know that too. And he said, very long. That's all he said. Very long. So we praise the Lord for that. Continue to pray for the others. We have Amy expecting and uh, Rachel Carson expecting here in the next few weeks as well. So we're looking forward to a baby boom at Bethel Baptist Church. Let's sing another song this evening. All right. Another one about the love of Jesus. Jesus loves even me. 633. Amen. Uh, Lord, give me a, a verse uh, just before the service. Psalm, and this goes along with our prayer meeting. Psalm 95, verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. 
Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Can I encourage you to spend some extra time in prayer and, and to stay in, and pray with us? Our church needs your prayer. We need your prayer. And, and, and God wants us to pray. Uh, Brian and Cindy uh, Thiessen, he's with uh, Baptist Church Planning Ministry and also with Baptist Missions to Forgotten People, the Canadian Field Administrator. Uh, dear praying, uh, prayer partners, we were blessed with an amazing time of learning and bounding, I'm sorry, bounding as a missionary family during our 2021 BMFP candidate training held in Hamilton the week of June 14th to 18th. This was the first time that our candidate training was held in Canada uh, conjointly with the training taking place in our offices in Jacksonville, Florida. Training sessions were streamed live in both directions. Our Canadian side, it was our biggest class with four new missionary units now officially serving with BMFP. Praise the Lord. Dad's final journey. This prayer letter was scheduled to be sent out in late June until my father's health took a decided turn for the worse. On June 23rd, my dad was admitted to, into palliative care at our local Windsor Hospital on Sunday, July 4th, just after 11 p.m. He said goodbye to this world's woes and suffering as he entered the presence of the Savior he loved. I had always envisioned Dad having some powerful last words of wisdom for me. That never happened because of his physical and uh, cognitive condition. However, God allowed me to be present the last time Dad closed his eyes here, and I spoke my final words to him. I love you, Dad. I'll see you soon. Your ongoing prayer for our family, especially my mom, is deeply appreciated. Let's have a word of prayer for the Thiessen family. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the many years that Brother Thiessen and his wife Cindy have served you, Lord, and, and seen uh, missionaries go out with the gospel and see churches planted and helping out here, Lord, as an assistant pastor. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon them. Be with Brother Thiessen's heart, comfort him with his dad's loss and his, his mom, Lord, that she would be comforted um, we thank the Lord for these four new missionary units serving with Baptist missions to forgotten people. Lord, I, I remember his dad was just such a, a, a nice man. It's so good to know, Lord, he's in your presence now. So I pray your blessing upon them as they serve you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight. Please turn to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. We have a list of things for you to pray about in this coming Sunday's bulletin. And I would encourage you to pray about these things as we look at uh, starting to reinstate some ministries and going forward with some things. Uh, that excites me, the idea that we can start seeing some kids come back to church and, and uh, getting, getting some of the ministries going again, Sunday school and such. And so I, but understand, we're going to put a list there. Everything's tentative. We're just praying that they won't blow up on us again and that uh, we can move forward. We're, we want to we wanna put one foot in front of the other and start praying that we can move forward. And so continue to pray uh, for that. August 1st, we're looking forward to uh, chicken on the grounds. We didn't get to have that last year. And it'll be a little bit different. We're going to bring our own picnic lunch. All right? That we'll still give you chicken. We promise you that. That's the main thing, right? But you bring your own potato salad, your own, uh, you know, whatever, and uh, we'll give you the chicken. Uh, just a buffet line probably won't work that well. You know, your nose is dripping, and nobody wants that. And so uh, we don't want to catch anything, so we'll just go ahead and do it that way. So bring your own picnic lunch, and, and we'll supply the chicken on August 1st. And what we're going to do is at 5 o'clock, we'll have the meal outside, but then we're going to come inside for church. And I know that's unusual, but we have set up and tore down so many times this year. 
I mean, I was thinking about it the other day. We have preached from the back of pickup trucks, the back of semi-trailers. We've preached to windshields. We've preached to empty rooms with cameras. We've preached to 10 people with cameras. We've preached in the olive room. We've preached in Tony Baker's classroom. Just everywhere you can imagine, we've done it, and we're so tired of moving things. So we decided we're going to eat, and we're going to let the sound guys and the TV guys have a good day. All right? And so we're just going to enjoy the music in here and the air conditioning, by the way. And uh, we pay a lot of money for air conditioning and a beautiful auditorium, and we've hardly got to use it in the last year and a half. So we're going to use it that day. The Featherstones are coming. We had planned on having the Thren family with us. They can't get across the border. And so we're going to have the Featherstones come at the last minute. We're appreciating that they're w willing to step in and do that. And so uh, if you don't know the Featherstones, they, they've been here before. They like playing banjos and guitars and mandolins, and then they sing along with that, and we'll have a good time with them. And then uh, Pastor Jerry Burns from Kitchener Baptist Church, who took over for Pastor Phil Clayton, will be preaching that night, and we're looking forward. Brother Burns is a gifted preacher. Uh, if you've never got to hear Brother Burns, you'll, you'll want to be here that night, especially uh, when he was 16 years old, he was preaching camps on the East Coast and just doing a great job even then. So he's, he's just a gifted preacher, a young man, and we're looking forward to having him on that night. So I want you to come. That's August the 1st. And then we're going to have our vacation Bible school at the end of August, all right? The last week of August, I believe it starts August uh, 29th or 30th, I'm, I'm trying, uh, August 30th, and it goes through about September 3rd, all right, the week leading up to Labor Day. And so we're having vacation Bible school every evening, and you'll want to look in the bulletin and get those times. We need workers, so please help us with that. And then on Sunday, we'll have our Sunday morning service, and then Sunday night, we're going to do a little different this year. This is Cody's idea, and so if it doesn't work, you blame him, all right? And so what we're going to do is our finale is going to be on Sunday night for VBS, he said that they tried that one time in Hamilton, and they found that they got a better turnout because the kids were coming every night at the same time, and so Sunday was just the same time, and they just came. It was a habit for them. And so that night, that week of Vacation Bible School, here's our prayer. We want to run buses. We haven't done that in a year and a half. All right, so we want to start running buses for Vacation Bible School. We've looked at, talked to Sharps, and we've looked at all the rules surrounding all that, and we're working on a plan to get the buses on the road. And then that Sunday night, we want to run buses uh, to bring kids and parents in for that service that night. And then the following Sunday, we want to run buses regular for Sunday school and master clubs. September the 8th is a Thursday night, or Wednesday night, we want to start our master clubs program that Wednesday night. Now, we've made some changes and you're going to hear more about that. Mr. Baker's going to have a meeting for Master Club workers. We're, we're moving Master Clubs just this year to Wednesday night. Now, I, I don't know what will happen next year, but for this year, we're moving it to Wednesday night. And you, you might ask why. Because we're going to try to limit the numbers a little bit still. And the reason we're doing that is if they do pull the rug out from under us, we'll be ready for it. And we'll be able to just keep moving and keep going forward uh, without much conflict. And so what we're doing is Wednesday nights will be only up to grade 6. And then on Thursday nights, the teens, junior high and senior high, will have their program on Thursday nights. That will save us struggling for time in the gym, little ones getting run over by big ones, and we'll just kind of limit how many are here. And so that way we'll have maybe uh, 120 instead of 220. And, and that'll help us. Then on Wednesday night, Thursday nights, the teens can have the whole gym to themselves and have a good program. Uh, so we're just trying to limit things a little bit just in case they try to pull things back a little bit. We'll be ready and still be able to go forward with our programs, Lord willing. And so pray about that. September 8th, we're hoping and praying we can start Master Clubs. All right, you'll hear more about that. So we've put a whole bunch of dates in the bulletin of things we're looking forward to. So September, or sorry, August 1st, I, I should have mentioned this. On August 1st, on Chicken on the Grounds Day, at 9.45 a.m., we're going to have a joint Sunday school. All right? So this Sunday, 1030 Church. There's no 8.30 service, okay? We're all together. Amen? Amen. We're all yeah, we're really excited. Amen. <laughs> I'm excited. We haven't had everybody together on a Sunday morning since a year ago, March. And so this Sunday morning, we'll have that. This Sunday morning, uh, except for our kids that come on the buses. So I'm hoping and praying it won't be long, and we'll see them back as well. So this week, we're going to, uh, no Sunday school, 10.30 service. The following Sunday, we're going to introduce Sunday school back, 9.45 We'll have a joint Sunday school. Everybody will be together, all right, for that first Sunday. And then the following week, on August the 8th, we'll go back to full regular Sunday school classes. And I don't know about you. You say, well, I don't like Sunday school. Can I tell you this? Come anyway. 
Because it's just saying we are back and we are moving forward uh, for the glory of God. And we want to we encourage one another in that. So come and be a part of your Sunday school class. And your connection group has activities besides Sunday school. And, and those are going to start ramping up now and going forward. And so we're looking forward to all these things. I'm excited about it. If you're not, I'll be here all by myself for Sunday school if I have to be. But we're going to have a good time in the house of God. Paul, you'll come, right? Amen. So you preach to me and I'll preach to you and we'll be doing well. Look at the book of Philemon. We, we just went through, if you'll remember, before we went on vacation, a, th- a three-week study of the book of Titus. We did chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, one each Wednesday night. And I said for a little while, uh, until we can get some stability on our meetings, we'll, we'll just do some short Bible studies through certain books. And um, so here we are in the book of Philemon, and we'll do this all in one night, Lord willing, unless we uh, find some rabbits to chase. But let's look together. We're just going to read the first seven verses, and then we'll pray, and we'll get right into this passage tonight. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Brother Judge, can you turn down the monitors for me? I'm getting a lot up here. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us understand this passage as we look at really what's just a singular subject, and yet there's so much other doctrine here. We pray that you'd help us to absorb it. We pray that the Spirit of God might teach it to us, illuminate the Word. Father, fill me with thy Spirit. Help me, I pray. Uh, Lord, as I teach, it's been a couple weeks now since I've stood before folks and preached the Bible. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would refresh my heart and mind, Lord, to uh, how to properly present the Scripture. So, Father, we'll thank you for all these things. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first three verses of the chapter tell us who this letter is addressed to. And if I can direct your attention there, because there's something that jumped out at me. The Bible says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, Paul is in a Roman prison as he writes this. There are other times that Paul writes and he talks about being a prisoner, but I don't know that he's always necessarily in prison at the time. He's in some varying degree. There's times where he's on a ship and he's being transported back to Rome to stand trial. And so in those times, yes, he's a captive and he's maybe even in chains at times, but he's not in a prison. He's traveling on a ship or what have you to be taken back to being tried. But at this point in time, he is literally in a Roman prison. And the Bible says as he writes of this bondage, he's writing, he's along with Timothy, who is there ministering to him, unto Philemon. And Philemon was a fellow in the church that Paul had come to love and, and perhaps even led to the Lord. He says, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Now notice some of the people he writes to. He talks about Philemon, who is a fellow laborer, and he is one that Paul will address here in a moment more directly. But he also talks about Appia, who he says nothing about. And then he says Archippus, who's our fellow soldier. Notice Philemon is a laborer, but Archippus is a soldier. Now when he uses the word fellow, he's implying that Paul says, I'm a laborer and I'm a soldier. But to Philemon, he says, you're a fellow laborer. And to Archippus, he says, you're a fellow soldier. And I think he's implying by the scripture that in every church, there are some who are laborers and some who are soldiers. I said, what is the difference? Well, I I suppose a soldier labors at times, and I suppose a laborer soldiers at times, but for the most part, a laborer is one who bears the weight of ministry, and they, they, they're the ones that teach the Sunday school, and they're the ones that, that run the buses, and they're the ones that labor to keep the church moving and doing the work of God. And a soldier, I believe, is likely who's one on the front lines, and they are taking a stand for Jesus Christ. 
A church needs both of those. Some, I believe, are gifted in both areas. Some who are laborers are also good soldiers. Some who are soldiers are also good laborers. But I think we all call to mind if we think about those terms. Well, I know so and so, but boy, they're just a faithful laborer in the church. They don't like being out in front. They're a behind the scenes kind of person and they labor faithfully for the Lord. They're always in their place. But then we can also picture the soldier of Jesus Christ who is standing out in front and they're bearing the weight of the battle and they are taking the arrows of the enemy. And, and so we can picture both and understand who Philemon and Archippus are. I don't know what... I, a Pia did, or uh, what he didn't do, the Bible does not say. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also writes to another group in verse 2. He says, and to the church in thy house. I suppose Archippus could have been considered a fellow soldier because to have a church in your house in the heart of the Roman Empire was a dangerous thing. To see people coming and going and holding a church service in, in a place that was fixed in nature and didn't move around and hide underground. He says, you have a church in your house. And I, I think that's perhaps why he was called a fellow soldier. But here's what we can learn from that phrase, the church in your house. It's this, though this letter we will find out in a moment is addressed primarily to Philemon, Paul is saying, hey, the rest of the church needs to listen up. Everybody else can benefit from what I'm about to say. Not me, the Apostle Paul. And so notice what he says. We come to verse 4 and we find the subject of Paul's prayer. He says this, I thank my God. That's prayer. Making mention of thee always in my prayers. And we're going to see what the subject is here. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. The subject of the Paul's prayer we see, first of all, in verse 5, is that they may be consistent in growth. So I didn't see that. Notice what it says with me in verse 5. Paul will say, I'm praying for you. I mention you always in my prayers. And verse 5, I have summarized it this way, that they might be consistent in growth. Notice what he says in verse 5. Hearing of thy love and faith. Do you know the two areas in the word of God? Listen, mark it up. You can look this up. Where we are called to grow most often, we are called to grow in our faith, and we are called to grow in our love. That's, that's what the Bible says over and over and over and over and over. We see it many times throughout the scriptures, and especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul. He says, if you're going to grow, I need you to grow in faith, and I need you to grow in love. How many of you remember the verse or recall when it says we need to grow in charity? That's love. We are to grow in faith, and that we might grow in love. There's very other few other areas in the Bible that we are to grow in. There are some verses where a bunch of things are grouped together and we are to grow in those things. Add to your faith, patience. We ought to grow in patience. Nobody wants to grow in patience because it's the trying of our faith that worketh patience. So we don't like having to go through what it takes to see patience coming alive. So we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's growing in our faith. And so we are to grow in faith and love. And, and notice what Paul notices about their love and faith. He says that the communication, or sorry, verse 5, I'm hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. He says there's two areas I'm seeing faith and love. One toward the Savior and two toward the saints. Can you imagine what kind of church we could have and every church could have if, if all they ever knew was I just want to grow in faith and love towards Jesus Christ and toward the saints. Yeah, you, you wouldn't worry about a lot of other things then. He said, well, what about patience? If you have faith and you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you love the saints, you'll have patience. Well, what about all those other things we're supposed to have? What about virtue? Oh, if you have faith and love toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward the saints... You'll have virtue. These are the two most important things. What did Jesus said? They asked him, what are the, what's the greatest command? He says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And he says, the second one's just as important as the first. 
love one another. That's what we're to do. The Bible says that the love of the brethren is evidence of our love for God. 1 John chapter 5. Notice what it says, 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him and begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. If you love God, you'll love his children, those that are begotten of him. So he's praying that they'll be consistent in their growth, that they'll continue to grow in faith and love. This spiritual growth, notice what it says in verse 7, it brought a joy and a peace in the church and to Paul. You know, a church that loves one another and is growing in faith and in love and makes a a, a concerted effort to to just grow and to learn the word of God and to, to, to grow in love towards one another, they we have great joy and consolation. Why? In thy love. That's an question. The bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. He's talking to Philemon. This spiritual growth will bring a great joy and a peace. So we notice the second thing that Paul's praying about. Number one, he's praying that they might be consistent in growth. But look at number two, that they may be communicating the gospel. Communicating the gospel. Verse 6 says this, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, I, I, I'm praying, one, that you'll continue to grow, and two, that you'll communicate the gospel, that, that you'll tell others about Jesus Christ. So how do we do that? Number one, through preaching the truth. Notice some key phrases here. He says, the communication of thy faith. Now, this isn't just any faith. You know, people have faith in a lot of things, but this is faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says at the end of that same verse, which is in you in Christ Jesus. A lot of people have faith in things that just aren't going to help them at all. But when you have faith in Christ Jesus, God says, I want you to communicate that faith. You know, I had this theory that I put to the test a little while ago. And my theory was, was that you can prove almost anything you say, uh, doesn't matter what it is, if you look it up on YouTube. Just Google it. And so people come to me with all these conspiracy theories in the world today. It doesn't matter what it is, all kinds of crazy ideas. Well, but I saw a video on YouTube, Pastor. Really? I said, Kelvin. I said, tell me the craziest thing you've ever heard. He says, there was once monkeys on the moon. So I got onto YouTube and I said, stand right here with me, Calvin. And I typed in monkeys on the moon. And all these videos came up with monkeys flying around space. And and they looked real, man. I'm telling you. I've had preachers send me videos. You need to watch this. This is true because it was on YouTube. Friends, the only truth I know is right here. If it doesn't line up with that, I don't want to hear it. Why not, pastor? Why not send me a Bible verse and say, this is why we're in the end times. Because the Bible says so. Jesus said this would happen. Paul said this would happen. Don't send me some YouTube videos that has all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories and saying, there, I knew it was true. Good night. I tell you what, Calvin can make a video that you wouldn't believe and you would believe it was true. He, he's got talent. To, if he can do it, so can others. We have to be very careful what we're looking at at the internet. and so. Paul says, listen, let, let's, let's get back to something more important. I'm going to pray about this. I want to pray that you communicate your faith. Preaching the truth of Jesus Christ as Savior. That's where our focus has to be. Listen, I'm going to tell you this. There's a lot of people out there that are scared to death of what's going on in our world. You say, what do they need? Oh, do they need to go get a vaccine? I don't know, maybe. Do they need to go and get this done, a, a surgery, an operation? They need a doctor. Do you know what they need? They need Jesus. They need Jesus. All the other things that they might need in this world are secondary to needing Jesus Christ. We need to communicate the truth. We need to preach the truth. So he says, I want you to preach the truth. Communicate your faith in Christ. And then he says, I want, I'm praying that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. That means powerful. It's the word dynamis or dynamite that we get the word dynamite from. He wants it to be effectual. And so where does the power of God come from? 
How can they communicate the gospel in a powerful way? I only know of two ways. Number one, as the Spirit blesses and illuminates the Word of God. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We are saved by the washing of the water of the Word. We are saved by incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God. It's the only, one of the only things I know that has the power to save lives is the unadulterated preaching of the truth from the word of God. He says, I want you to be effectual. And the second thing I think of is as the spirit of God fills the one communicating. We go out and we say, well, I told them the gospel, but they never got saved. And, uh, they don't even seem like they're moved by it. Were you filled with the spirit of God? God fills a man or a woman and he uses them to communicate the truth of God's word. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. You can keep your finger in Philemon. And look just back just a couple pages. Or swipe right a couple times. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. And so what has that got to do with being filled? Do you know what a vessel's for? A vessel's to be filled. Timothy is, Paul is writing to Timothy and using the illustration. He says there's, in, a, in a great house, there's all kinds of vessels, all kinds of vessels, Some to honor and some to dishonor. Some are made of gold and silver and precious. Others are made of wood and clay. But none of that matters. It just matters that they're clean and purged so that they can be filled with the master and be used for his glory. He said, well, I don't have the talent. It doesn't matter if you don't have the talent of so-and-so. I just don't have a natural, it doesn't matter. Are you clean and empty? And able to be filled by God. That's what will change lives. Paul says, I'm praying that you might communicate the gospel, but I want it to be effectual or powerful. So we see that they are to communicate the gospel. Look back in Philemon, one, through the preaching of the truth. Number two, through personal testimony. Through personal testimony. He says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Don't ever underestimate just what sharing your testimony will do. Telling people what Jesus did for you, how he changed your life. So we preach the gospel in a powerful way, but we also, he says, tell about the good things God has done for you. Make it personal. And so he's praying uh, for two things. As we look at his prayer, first of all, we see that they might be consistent in growth, and secondly, that they might be communicating the gospel Look at number two in verse eight. We've talked about the subject for which Paul prays. Notice secondly, the servant for which Paul pleads. The servant for which Paul pleads. Verse eight. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Let's stop there for a moment and let's look at this. So now we get down to the the subject of Paul's letter. Paul in the first three verses is giving a greeting and who he's writing the letter to. And now in verses four through seven, he he says to them, he says, I've been praying for you and I'm praying that you'll continue in your growth and I'm praying that you'll you'll share the gospel, you'll communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, by preaching truth and by your personal testimony that you'll tell many people about Jesus. But now let me get to the subject of my letter. I'm here to plead on behalf of a servant named Onesimus. By piecing this story together, we, it seems that Onesimus was a, a servant in the house of Philemon. I think you would probably see that pretty easily. He's writing to Philemon, and uh, he's talking about this servant. And he tells him, he was not profitable to you before, but now he's profitable to me. We saw that in the last verse we read. And he, he'll say some more in a moment, but that's, that's the gist of who Philemon is. He's, or, or who Onesimus is, he's a servant in the house of Philemon. Now, I think... This is just my opinion. 
I think that when Paul was establishing the church there in that house, Philemon heard him, or Onesimus heard him preach. And something began to stir in his heart. And so one day while he's working along and he's serving uh, Philemon, he says, I got to go to Paul. I've got to go hear more about this. And I hear that Paul's in prison. So you know one thing that's good about prison? He'll be easy to find. He's not moving around on a ship. He's not traveling on some missionary journey. He's stuck in a jail cell. And Nisimus says, at least I'll be able to find him. So he goes to Rome and he finds Paul there in a prison. And Paul says he was begotten in his bonds. In other words, Paul was able to lead him to Jesus Christ. So notice some things we see here. First of all, Paul comes to them with a gracious consideration. This is important for us to learn. A gracious consideration. Verse 8 says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Let me put that in modern English for you. Paul says, I think I have enough respect just to tell you, listen, you better do what's right, buddy. I think I could, I could be bold enough to enjoin thee to that which is convenient or right. I, I should have enough respect that I can just walk in that church and say, listen, here's how it should be. You listen and obey. But Paul is more gracious than that. And he says in verse 9, notice what he says, yet... For love's sake, because I love you, I rather beseech thee. Let me plead with you. Let me beg you. Let me pray with you. Being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You say, why does he say Paul the aged? Because I think he's saying to them, I've had to learn this. <laughs> it's taken some time. Paul was the one that stood up in Peter's face and was, was stood him to the face. Paul was the one that rebuked people openly. Paul was the one that ran his mouth a little bit. Paul was the one that says, when I first came to you, it was not with enticing words. I wasn't a very uh, soft preacher. He says, later on, I learned how I needed to come to you as a nurse that cherished their children. But when I first came, I was pretty rough. Paul says, now I'm Paul the aged. And at one time, I might have just commanded it, but now I'm going to beseech you. I'm going to come to you graciously. And I'm going to plead on his behalf. And I'm going to ask you, please, would you consider this? There's something for us to learn there. Sometimes we throw our weight around and say, well, you know, these are my rights. And this is what I deserve. And my children ought to just obey me. And, and uh, I was, you know, it was interesting. I was talking to somebody the other day. And they were just telling me, you know, I, we had this issue. And he says, I, my, my, my flesh said, I'm just going to go fix it. I'm going to go and I'm going to set things straight. He says, but... Something said, why don't you pray about that a little while? He said, I began to pray about it. And I began to seek God about it. And I let it go for and just quietly continue to pray. And he says, all of a sudden, the whole situation changed. He says, I didn't have to go in a fight with anybody. I didn't have to throw my weight around. I could have because I'm dad. He says, but by praying about it, the whole thing just changed. That's what Paul's saying here. He says, I'm just going to come to you graciously, and I'm going to plead with you, and I'm going to ask you to do the right thing. Paul was hoping and praying that they had grown enough spiritually that they would respond appropriately. Look at verse 14. Without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefits should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. He says, I'm not going to do this unless you agree. He says, I want your mind on this. I want this to be of your benefit, not of necessity, but willingly. And so he says, I'm just going to play, pray with you and beseech. You know, prayer can appeal to the mind of God and turn the heart of man if we are allowing the Spirit of God to do the work. You can command or you can graciously beseech. So we see a gracious consideration. Look at verse 10. We also see a glorious conversion. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I be, have begotten in my bonds. Onesimus got saved. He says, Philemon, i got to tell you something about Onesimus. He left you one way, but he's coming back a child of God. He's saved now. He's different. And so before you make this decision to crack down on him and get angry with him, I don't know what his sin was other than that he perhaps he left a job without giving notice. Just didn't show up to work one day. He was a servant. I, I don't know if there was some sort of contract that maybe he broke. I don't know. But we do know that it was egregious enough for Paul to write to Philemon and say, hey, please forgive him. He did wrong. But now he wants to come back. He's a child of God. 
So we see there's a glorious conversion that takes place. And notice in verse 11, he says this, Because of his salvation, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Number one, he was made a profitable servant. A prof- Isn't it amazing what the gospel will do? Onesimus was a servant under contract of some sort. He left a job without giving proper notice. He just didn't show up, perhaps. Maybe he left his work undone, and it was vital. I don't know. But notice what Paul says. He might have been a sluggard before, but now he's profitable because his heart has changed. His life has changed. And I have no doubt when he comes back, that guy that just loafed along through his day and just was there to draw a paycheck, now he's going to work hard. He's going to be a profitable servant. See, when, we, when God changes us, he doesn't just change our heart. He changes our attitude as well. So he says he's, he's made a profitable servant. Verse 13, he also ministered to Paul's suffering. Verse 12, let me read it first. Whom I have sent again, so he's coming home. Thou therefore receive him, that is my own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me. He says, he's been such a blessing to me, I don't want him to leave. He says, I, I would rather he stay here instead of going to you, because he's been ministering to my suffering. He's been a real blessing to me. He's profitable. And so God, we just see that through this conversion, lives completely changed. He was made a profitable servant. He ministered to Paul's suffering. But look at this. I'm going to read down to verse 16, verse 14. Without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefits should not be as it were of, of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So this glorious conversion made him a profitable servant. It ministered to Paul's suffering, but it made him a precious sibling. He was now a child of God. And Paul says, listen, when you receive him back, don't treat him like a servant. Now he's your brother. And you don't have to boss him around. He's going to work harder than ever before. Because not just his heart, but his attitude has changed. That's what the gospel will do. So Paul comes to him with this gracious consideration based on this glorious conversion. And all these things were as the providence of God. Verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shalt receive him forever. God had a plan in this. You might not have liked that he ran away, and you might not have liked that he left you without workers for a few days, but let me tell you this, God had a plan. He departed for a season, but he might return to you forever, and you'll know him for all eternity. What is the last thing tonight? We've talked about the, the subject of Paul's prayer, and the, uh, we've talked about the servant for which Paul pleaded, but I want you to notice the spirit in which Paul pleads. How did he pray and how did he ask? We've already talked about that a little bit with a gracious consideration and how he came to him beseeching. But look at how the spirit he comes to them in verse 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on my account. We see first of all the spirit of partnership. Paul was asking for a certain level of trust based on the relationship. You know, the Bible says that we should not be unequally yoked. We sometimes talk about marriage when we hear that, unequally yoked. But I believe that's a lot broader scope than than just marriage. We ought to be careful about business relationships saved with unsaved people. Why is that? Paul's saying, now listen, Philemon did you wrong, but now he's a child of God. He's changed his heart, his attitude, his behavior. Everything has changed about him. And he says, now we're, 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 we're partners. And Onesimus is our partner. And I'm just pleading with you as children of God, let's be equals. Let's work together. And if, if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. If there's anything I can do to make this right, I want to help. That's the spirit of partnership. Are we reconcilers? Are we those that are trying to help a situation and help heal a a broken relationship? And then we see, secondly, not just the spirit of partnership, but the spirit of pardon. Verse 18, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest me 
even thine own self besides. Paul is saying, would you pardon him? I'll pay it. I'll take that burden. When I read that, I thought of this. I thought, that is the demonstration of Christ's redemption. I have all the riches of Christ Jesus because Jesus took my penalty on the cross. And Paul is saying, I want Philemon to be restored, not as a slave or a servant, but as a brother. Why? I'll take the penalty. If he owes you anything, if there's work to be done, I'll do it. I'll pay the price. We see such a spirit of Christ in Paul as a demonstration of Christ's redemption, but then we see that he's dreaming of the correct response. He says, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. But he's using a little leverage and saying, I'm just praying you'll do the right thing because you owe me. You owe me. Notice the last thing. We're talking about the different spirits in which Paul comes to, the spirit in which he pleads, he, the spirit of partnership, the spirit of pardon. But then we see in verse 20, the spirit of pride. He says, isn't pride a bad thing? There's, there's sinful pride, but then there's a good pride. It's good to be proud of certain things. Are you proud of your children's accomplishments? Are you proud when, I remember coaching ball and we win trophies. We're proud of the kids, they win trophies. We were proud when we heard Emily got salutatorian uh, when she graduated Bible college. And you're just proud of certain things. It's not sinful to be proud of those things. And, And that's the type of pride I'm talking about. Notice the spirit of pride Paul had for these people. He says, yea, brother, let me have joy in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. He, he, he's have, he says, I, I'm proud, Philemon, of who you've become. He says, I want you to refresh my bowels in the Lord. I know you'll do it because I'm proud of you. He says, you're the kind of guy that encourages my heart. And in verse 21, not as he only proud of who he'd become, he has pride in how he would obey. He says, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Perhaps Timothy is saying to Paul, do you think he'll do it? And Paul's like, oh yeah. Philemon's a great guy. He says he was hurt when Onesimus left and you know, he's a boss and so he's trying to manage a staff and he's trying to pay guys and, and he's losing man hours by a guy running off and he says, yeah, he's hurt, but He's a fantastic guy. I'm proud of him. And I know that my bowels will be refreshed. Boy, that doesn't sound right, does it? My bowels will be refreshed. It just doesn't sound like something you should say from the pulpit, but that's what the Bible says. And he says, he says, but I also know this. I am confident he's going to obey. I'm not worried about this because it's the right thing. Well, we can learn a lot about that. Just, just be obedient, have a good attitude, Approach people graciously and see how God will change hearts. The last several verses, Paul, just his standard signing off. There salute thee, Epaphras, or sorry, verse 22. But withal prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Paul, not being very far from this church, saying, I believe when they release me from prison, they're going to release me to you. So prepare me a room. Give me a lodging ready. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. You know, Paul really had to learn throughout his ministry how to deal with people. And that's what the book of Philemon really is about and what it really helps us to learn Yes, he's pleading for Onesimus, and yes, he wants Philemon to understand he's a child of God now, and he, he, he's profitable. He can work alongside you now and treat him as a brother, not as a servant. Love him, and I'll, and I'll be proud of you. But what we really learn from this passage is how do we deal with people? Paul knew how to deal with people. He say, was he perfect? No, because that fellow there at the end, Demas, Later on, Paul will write, Demas hath forsaken me. Paul had hurts too. But as graciously as he could, he tried, especially as he got older, to learn how to deal with people and love people. Sometimes we we want our way so badly, we'll fight and push back and argue, and it's just not worth it. Paul says, one of the great things about your church is that I hear of your love and your faith toward Jesus Christ and to all the saints. 
Keep growing on that. Keep focusing on that. And that's where we want to go as a church as well. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Help us to learn from this passage tonight and to grow and, Lord, to be more Christ-like every day. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.